today is for lesson two, we're talking about the prologue, the chorus, and the opening scene of the play. I told you last time that the first thing we would do is look at the cast of characters. I want us to do that now. There are a lot of characters, as I said, over 20 in this play. But I think we can simplify things a little bit by creating a table. On one side of the table, we can put one of the families, the Montagues. And on the other side, the Capulets. If we list the Montagues, it's Montague, Lady Montague, Romeo, Benvolio, Ebram, and Balthazar. And finally, on that side, let's put Friar Lawrence, even though he's not a member of the family. On the other side, the Capulets. We'll have Capulet, Lady Capulet, Juliet, Tybalt, Samson, and Gregory, who we'll meet soon, and then the nurse. The nurse is not a part of the family, but let's put her there too. You'll see in the table that actually these characters all match up very nicely in the play, and they're basically equivalents for each other, for the two sides of the family. This makes things a lot easier to understand as we read, if we keep this in mind. The characters are equals with each other on both sides of the family. Moving on from there, we can actually get into the play itself with the prologue. I mentioned last time for the chorus that the chorus comes from Greek theater, and the purpose of the chorus is to serve as the audience itself. It explains to you what's happening. It summarizes. If we look at the chorus here, you'll see that the chorus tells us a little bit too much. You might have heard of the phrase, spoiler alert. That's when you tell someone the ending of a movie. They might not want to know who dies at the end, who gets married. The chorus here actually ruins the play for you if you don't want to know what happens at the end. Let's take a little look and see how it does that. It sets up the scene by telling us there are two households, the Capulets and the Montagues, and they're both alike in dignity. Like I said, the characters match up on both sides. It also tells us the setting. It's in Verona. That's not actually very important for our reading, but that is where we lay our scene, it says. Then it tells us what's going on with these families. He says, from ancient grudge to new mutiny. The sense of that word ancient is that it's been going on, this problem between the households, for a very long time. And now, in this scene, in this play, there'll be a new mutiny, a new problem. It actually makes use of a literary device here called antithesis. Antithesis is when you take two words that are opposites and use them in a phrase. Here we have ancient, very old, and new. After that, it tells us a little bit about what's going to happen in the play. It doesn't use the names of Romeo and Juliet, but it says a pair of star-crossed lovers. Star-crossed means ill-fated. Bad things are going to happen to them. And they came from their parents' fatal loins. Loins means they gave birth to them. They're the parents. But what happens? In line eight, you'll see it says, doth with their death bury their parents' strife. Doth with their death means they're going to die. We already know on the very first page that Romeo and Juliet are not going to make it. That's a spoiler. Notice the word doth and previous to that, misadventured. This is called archaic diction. Archaic diction is the use of words that we no longer use anymore. Doth, for example, is does or do. And misadventures, eh, it means bad things happen to them. After that, it tells us a little bit about how they're going to die. It tells us explicitly that they will take their life. They're going to commit suicide. On the first page, we already know the tragic ending. The chorus also tells us how long the play will be, which might be nice. It says there are two hours traffic of this stage, so the play takes about two hours. And then in the final lines of the chorus, they say that if you watch the play, we will tell you how this happened. What here shall miss, what we didn't tell you here, our toil, our work, shall strive to mend. So we'll fill in the gaps, even though you know what's going to happen. Moving from there, let's take a look at Act One, Scene One. And we already know where we are. We're in Verona. 
If you see the stage direction, it tells us that Samson and Gregory enter armed with swords and bucklers. The sense here already is one of violence. The swords, the bucklers, a kind of shield. So we already have, with the stage direction, an idea of violence. We also see this in Gregory and Samson's dialogue as they speak to each other. They use a play on words of the words coals, colliers, collar, and collar. You'll notice all of these words sound very similar. That's because they're called homophones. Homophones are two words that sound the same, but have different meanings. Like the word orange and orange. One is a color and one is a fruit. Two completely different things. Here we have coals. To carry coals means the job of a coal miner. And then colliers also means the idea of carrying coal. And then collar, which means anger. And then collar, which is a collar around your neck. The movement here that I would say is carrying coals or being a collier is a job. You're a coal miner. And then tying that together with the homophone of kohler, you have the word anger. So Gregory and Samson's job, we might say, is one of anger. And that ties with their swords and their bucklers. And then the collar is part of the meaning of the play, I think. Because this ancient grudge of the families, it is a collar on the families. And it's a collar that leads them to great violence, which also leads to the deaths of Romeo and Juliet. And only when they can take off this collar and free themselves of their violent anger can they overcome this long-held grudge. There's a more play on words between Samson and Gregory and you might say they're kind of a funny characters for comedic effect. You'll see how Gregory and Samson talk about the meaning of a word, move versus stir. The lines go, Samson says, a dog of the house of Montague moves me. To move is to stir, and to be valiant is to stand. Therefore, if thou art moved, thou runnest away. A dog of that house shall move me to stand. You can see how they're playing with these words, move and stand. And actually, in staging of this, we might want to use this for great humor between these two characters who are very violent by nature. The violence continues throughout, especially when two more characters enter the stage, Abram and Balthazar. If we look at our table again, we see that Abram and Balthazar are the equals of Samson and Gregory for the house of Capulet and the house of Montague. And before they enter, Gregory says to Samson, draw thy tool. The tool he's speaking of here is the sword. Samson says, my naked weapon is out. So he's actually drawn his sword as these two enter. And what Gregory and Samson want to do here is they want to start a fight. Samson says to Gregory in an aside, which I mentioned last time, this means no one else can hear it, only Gregory can. He says, is the law of our side if I say A? And Gregory has an aside, no. The use of the aside here is very interesting because they're trying to start a fight with Abram and Balthazar and they're on the stage, but the aside means they can't hear it. It also could be used for great humorous effect to show that these two characters, Samson and Gregory, although they're very violent, they're also still afraid of something greater than them. They're afraid of the law, which will be represented by the prince who speaks at the end of this opening scene. So let's look a bit at these swords that we've been speaking of. Because we'll see, after Abram and Balthazar enter, and a fight begins, it says in the stage direction, they fight. We have the entrance of another character, Benvolio. If you saw in our characters again, Benvolio matches up with Tybalt, who's going to enter right after Benvolio. And Benvolio says to all these four men fighting on the stage, put up your swords, you know not what you do. There's been an entrance of them with swords, draw thy tool, my naked weapon is out, and they're fighting. If we look at the sword, it gives us a chance to look closely at archetypes in literature. Archetypes are a type of symbol that throughout literary history, they've been used over and over again for the same meaning. It might remind you of tropes from last time. A trope was a story that's told over and over again so we know what to expect, like boy meets girl. 
when you see a sword or a knife or a dagger or a gun. We might type of, think of it as a type of archetype, specifically a masculine archetype. Masculine archetypes are those that represent commonly held ideas of what masculinity is. Men in literature are strong. They like violence and destruction. That's versus feminine archetypes like flowers or houses, things that comfort us or that are beautiful. Not to say that all men are violent, not to say that all women are weak and fragile, just to say that these archetypes have that meaning in literature. One archetype you'll see throughout this play is the archetype of the sword as a symbol of violence. One more archetype I want you to look for that you'll see over and over again is the idea of light or the sun versus darkness and the moon. And look at those as we go through and think about what they might mean for the book as a whole. And we'll talk about them later. Moving through, we see that Benvolio tries to stop the fight and then Tybalt, his equivalent on the other family, enters and he starts a fight with Benvolio. Now on the stage, we have six people all fighting each other. The violence is clear. The stage direction tells us that these characters too, Tybalt and Benvolio, fight. And then several citizens come on, the stage direction tells us, and they too are fighting. Clubs, bills, and partisans strike, beat them down, down with the Capulets, down with the Montagues. A very violent scene overall. Even Capulet and his wife and Montague and his wife come on the scene. And Capulet and Montague, they want to join the fight too. They say, what noise is this? Give me my long sword. Montague says, thou villain Capulet, hold me not, let me go. The only ones we have here who do not want to fight are the two female characters, Lady Capulet and Lady Montague. Lady Capulet says to her husband, when he calls for a sword, she says, a crutch, a crutch, why call you for a sword? And Lady Montague says to her husband, thou shalt not stir one foot to seek a foe. Do you see how these archetypes are at play? The sword as a masculine symbol is violent, and all the male characters are violent too. But the two female characters that are first introduced are calling for peace. Very interesting, I think. I want to take a look at just one more thing. And this is a little bit complicated, but we want to look at the syntactical structure of the lines. Because the way that Shakespeare uses this can let us know the status of the characters. We can do this just by looking at those lines from Capulet and Lady Montague. And what we want to do is something sounds complicated, but I'll show you an easy way. We need to count the number of syllables in the line, the number of sounds. What noise is this? Give me my long sword. A crutch, a crutch, why call you for a sword? Do you see how these lines have 10 sounds, 10 syllables? This is a pattern called iambic pentameter. And you'll notice that Tybalt and Benvolio speak in the same pattern. What art thou drawn among these heartless hinds? 10. And Benvolio, I do but keep thee peace. Put up thy sword. 10. Now, if we looked at Samson and Gregory and Balthazar and Abram, they don't speak like this. Why not? Characters that speak with 10 syllables or in iambic pentameter, they're characters of royalty. So we can quickly see in a text the status of the characters. Do they, are they from nobility? Do they have money? Are they educated? They'll speak in iambic pentameter. Are they not? Then they won't. Very interesting, I think. And for next time, we'll finally get to meet one of our title characters, Romeo, and get a peek at Juliet.